Hey, guys. So let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the blessing of being in your body, to being in a place that is sanctified and set aside for you, in a place where we look to hear from you, that you would speak to our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that your word would be able to break through all of the cacophony of sounds and voices, and that we would hear you, that we might come to a closer relationship with you, and Lord, a closer likeness to you. We pray that you help us. We dedicate this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> we have been going through the book of First Peter. Last week, we finished up chapter 3. We were looking at all of these admonitions, and I usually do an overview quickly so that you guys understand the flow of the letter, where we were, and maybe it will help you to remember. Uh, we were looking at Peter's admonition to us through the scripture that we should do good, because who in the world's going to, who's going to, you know, really mess with you if you want to do good? I mean, it's certainly better than doing bad because everyone will mess with you, right? I don't know about you, but when I was a person doing bad things all the time, I was always looking out for the police. <laughs> but who, who will come after you if you want to do what's good? And it just makes sense to do right, and don't you wish everyone did? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you're blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats or be troubled because the Lord tells us that he'll be with us. And don't be worried about people. We should be more reverent toward God. And the people, the people are the things that you fear, the things that will control you. Do you know that? If you're afraid of heights, it will control you. It will tell you where you will go and where you won't go. You will never go on a cruise and look over the edge. Right? You'll never go on a ladder and clean out your gutters. There's a lot of things that you'll never do. And whatever it is that you fear controls you. It's the same thing if you fear God. You know that. Okay, good. <laughs> and this is Peter, who got hung upside down on a cross, by the way. And so he talks about, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you're blessed. And don't be afraid of them. Because don't be afraid of the one who can take your body alone because God is able to take your soul, and that's the more important thing, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens is we tend to fear things and people more than we fear God, and it causes us to do all sorts of things, like lie, cheat and steal. We do all sorts of things like that when we want to avoid pain. Uh, somebody told me that getting old is nothing more than just avoiding effort. <laughs> and I said, no! Because it's through those things that the Lord works in our heart. Sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Boy, that's uh, when you put God on the throne of your hearts, you, you make a decision um, like that. That's where everything begins. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is in you. You got a reason for hope? Yeah. Two people do. Okay. <laughs> Do you guys have a reason for hope? Yeah. All right, I feel so much better. <laughs> Be ready to give a reason to somebody who says, what's up with that? What's going on there? You, you, seem, you seem kinder. You, you didn't snap at me. You didn't uh, do all those things that everybody else does. You don't talk about the same things everybody talks about. You're not all, you know, crazed with the election. <laughs> There's a reason for hope in you. And do it with meekness and fear. You never want to jam the gospel down somebody's throat in a forceful fashion. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile you for your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better for you, if it is the will of God, to suffer for good than for doing evil. If you're doing right and you suffer, that's good and commendable before God. If you're doing wrong and you suffer, it's your own fault. That's right. That's right. If you suffer because you're weird, you deserve it. You're weird, you know. <laughs> But if you do something good and you suffer for it, that gives praise to God if you do it well with the right heart. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Amen. Amen. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive 
in the spirit. He's now introducing a principle which is going to carry on to chapter 4. Jesus said no to all of the desires of the body and lived for God. And he died physically, but he also died, if you saw the temptation of Jesus, and I walked through that in Matthew, you can see where he was tempted, and he said, no, 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 I won't do it, no matter what you offer me, whether it be kingdoms, or, uh, you know, food, when I haven't eaten for 40 days and nights, whatever it is that you're going to offer me, position, status, it's not worth it, I'm not going to do it, and Jesus died to those desires for comfort, and um, for the body to be appeased. And so he's putting this principle out there. He's being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long sufferings waited, long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. If you remember, there were those who were the the sons of God came down to the daughters of men and they chose any of them that they wished and they had offspring which were these giant men and uh, there's, there's proof of it everywhere. It says that those spirits in prison, uh, Jesus when he, when he resurrected, he went down there and kind of told them, hey, it, it's, it's happening just like it was supposed to. And there's, there's an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of filth from the flesh. It's, it's not a bath. It's not a washing. But the answer of a good conscience towards God. It's faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. You see, because of his deep humiliation, God exalted him. And so we find this principle. It's not in exalting yourself that you're exalted. It's in humbling yourself that God exalts you. And that's a position you can keep because God's the one who keeps it for you. So this week we're going to get into chapter 4. We're going to talk about darkness and life, and light rather. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Hmm. Ceasing from sin. I, I like that idea. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he no longer should live as the rest of his time in his flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Amen. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. And I have it there twice. God help me. <laughs> Verse 3. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason... The gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. When Peter writes, it's not um, kindergarten. <laughs> it's deeply theological, and you wouldn't expect this from a fisherman. And yet, even as he was before the Sanhedrin and giving an account of what they did, they took note that he had spent time with Jesus. And you can see it coming out as the Spirit writes these things. So let's take it a verse at a time. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. So we're to have the same mind that Christ had. Jesus suffered in the flesh. Why do we think that we won't suffer? There are lots of Christian congregations that believe, well, Jesus came and he suffered and he died so that I don't have to suffer. You know, you're setting yourself up for a fall. Mm -hmm. Because it says, because he suffered, we will suffer. He's left an example for us. So what happens if I go to a church that everybody seems to be wealthy and happy and healthy, and of course, they'll never die, and they'll live forever, and they'll never have anything wrong with them, and they're all wealthy? What happens when you have a problem? 
that you suddenly feel like I'm not good enough, God doesn't love me, Jesus didn't die for me, and there's absolutely no way I could be saved, I'm just not good enough or smart enough. Because of your bad theology, it's going to set you up for a fall. And I think the devil just loves to do that. We will suffer in this life because this world is not as it should be. That's why there's no sin in heaven. Because we're going to press the reset button and everything will change. So we will suffer while we're here. We're all going to die of something, right? If the Lord doesn't take us, we're all going to die of something. It's, it's that thing that everybody's running from in, in this life is death, you know, or the pain of death. We're all going to go. So Jesus suffered in the flesh. The scripture in 1 Peter 2, 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. The scripture flat out says, if you're a Christian, if you're going to follow Christ, those who wish to live holy in Christ will be persecuted. It's a guarantee. It's not an option. And it's part of the tools that God uses to, ch to chisel us into his image. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Like I read previously, this comes into bear with where Peter's going with the rest of his letter. In 2 Corinthians 4.16.18, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day, for our light affliction, notice it's assumed, that it's a universal thing, which is but for a moment, in comparison with eternity, it's a moment, is working for us a far greater and exceeding eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It's amazing how much attention we show to the things that are seen. I got up today, I had to pick a tie, I had to pick a shirt that fit and almost fits my neck, right? You got to pick out shoes and it's all got to work together or somebody's going to say something. But as it is, a couple of people said I looked really good today. It's an astounding thing that all I need is a little bit of clothing. So. The clothes making the man thing. Anyway, the things that are seen are temporary. The things that we s quite often spend lots of time with and absorb ourselves with are temporary, fleeting, nothing. And we waste our lives, which, by the way, you're only given one because the scripture says it's appointed unto a man once to die in that judgment. So you don't get to recycle your life. You don't come back as a frog or anything like that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> But just, just imagine you're, you're missing getting captured and eaten, too, so that's okay. But even though our outward man is perishing, those things that are seen, our light affliction is but for a moment, and it works in us this thing that is far exceeding the difficulty and the hardship in our life. It creates the character of Jesus Christ. Amen? In 1 Peter 5.10, we'll get there. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, this is the same group of people, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Which tells me that is a tool that God uses to get you those things. If you're unsettled, maybe things haven't been hard enough on you. Because those difficulties make us lean on the Lord. It puts us on our knees and it says, God, help me. I, I need wisdom. I need help. God, my God, I cry out, like we just sang. In fact, the difficulties, I think, that's what they're supposed to do is give glory and honor to God. Christ suffered, and so, so will we. The scripture says, arm yourselves with the same Mind. In other words, you set your mind and you stiffen your, yourself. You make a decision. Ephesians 6, 12 to 13 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Do you know people aren't your problem? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. You see, we wrestle against spiritual forces. 
some of them within us, some of them without. It's not people that are a problem. It's spirits. And if we recognize that and look to the unseen, we can handle it and we can show grace to people very easily, right? Because I really don't have a problem with you. I got a problem with spirit that might be behind you. So I don't have to freak out and snap, which I comfort myself with these words all the time. Therefore, take up the whole armor. It says to arm yourself. It, it comes from armor, by the way. Therefore, take up your whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So there's something that we're to put on, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the truth uh, around our waist, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. And prayer. It's interesting, it's listed last. That's usually where people put it in order. And prayer, which is also a weapon. So we arm ourselves against these things. If you just say, well, it's the weekend. I'm going to put my feet up. I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to do a lot of nothing. Will you be ready for Monday morning? That's why people roll their eyes on Monday morning. Because they're not ready. They're not prepared. And especially the spiritual forces that are going to come against you when you go to work and you have to be with people. Am I right, people? I mean, I got a cake job. You guys have it hard. I just have to deal with you. <laughs> so we arm ourselves because if we're not armed, we could be taken by surprise. And we're not to be taken by surprise. Have the same mind. In Philippians 2, 5 to 8, it says, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross." So Jesus is our example. If you say you're, there, you're a Christian, this should be your mindset. Make yourself nothing. Become a servant of everyone. Well, that, that, that's a very different sermon than I heard. I thought it was this feel good, come to Jesus, and all your dreams will be fulfilled, and you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Boy, that would be great, but that's called heaven, and it's not going to be here. But what he'll do is he'll give you the wisdom, he'll give you the armor, and he'll give you all that you need for this life. In fact, he already has. You just need to write a check and make, make the withdrawal. Colossians 3, 1 to 4. So then you were raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died. Did, did you know you died? That's what Monica's going to do when she gets baptized today. Not a physical death. But it is declaring, I am dead to myself. I, I am not in charge of myself anymore. I give myself to Christ. That's what it is to be a Christian, a follower of Christ. <clears throat> For you died. It, wouldn't it be interesting to throw a funeral for yourself? Get a box. Lay in it. Everybody come. Invitations. Lay in the box. You know, I think we're supposed to do that every day. Declare ourselves dead every day. I'm not my own. I was bought with a price. I'm going to glorify God with my body. So have a funeral. You died, and your life is hidden in Christ and God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears... Then also will appear, you will appear with him in glory. You see, it's about sending it ahead. It's like the best retirement plan ever. So we're to have the same mind in Christ Jesus. It says that for the one who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Well, that sits a little uncomfortable with me because I'm still a sinner. And I feel like I've died with Christ and I'm a Christian and I've given him my life and yet I haven't ceased from sin. Some of you know this personally. 
So I've been rude or un unloving or um, and take your pick. There's a whole cornucopia of things. Ceased from sin. And so you, you got to wonder what in the world does this mean? If you suffer in the flesh, you cease from sin. And it's not talking about Jesus, by the way. It's talking about us. So, let me give you a couple of passages to back it up. In 2 Peter verses 1, 3, and 4, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given us these exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these that you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The scriptures are telling us that the promises of God enable us to enter into a divine nature. Now, if any of you are good and schooled in the scriptures, you know what it says. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? You also know that the heart is desperately wicked above all things who can know it, right? That there's none who are good, no, not one. All of them collectively have become unprofitable. They have the, the, the poison of asps on their tongues. In other words, all, all their body, their, their feet are quick to run to sin. It goes over all the parts of the body and how they're all contaminated. And yet in Christ, something happens. My motives change. Amen. The Spirit of God comes and inhabits my body. I don't think the same anymore. I read the scriptures and they aliven me and I do stupid things and I feel under conviction and I feel bad and, 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 I, and I weep. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I was a guy who wouldn't weep for any reason. Can't make me cry. <laughs> and yet, in Christ, I'm, I do those things because the Spirit of God is in me. I do those things because I have a new nature. Amen. You have a new nature. Don't say you guys, you know, oh, I'm just desperate, wicked, horrible, terrible, dirty, no good. You know, God didn't say that. He says through his promises, you become a partaker of the divine nature, which means something needs to change about you. Your speech, what you do, where you go, who you hang with. You got to draw near to the Lord and suddenly everything begins to change. And if you haven't had that experience, maybe because of the promises of God being offered to you, you haven't received them. But your life Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Does your life resemble that? It should. If it doesn't, maybe you haven't believed the promises. Maybe you haven't taken them as your own and entered into a divine nature. It doesn't mean we don't, you know, it, it doesn't mean we're sinless. It means we sin less because God comes into our life and takes control because we're not our own. Amen? Just want to show you this. So this whole ceasing from sin thing, I don't know. 2 Peter 1.10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. In other words, make, make sure that you know that you know that you know Jesus, right? For if you do these things, you will never stumble. You know, there's a list of things that you're supposed to add to your faith. And it says, if you add to your faith, if you do all these things, you'll never stumble. You'll never stumble? Well, Peter, he could, you know, the Bible can't mean that. Don't you dare rationalize, <laughs> rationalize the word of God away. You'll never stumble. If you are continually, listen, if I take a glass and I want to empty it of air, I could try to make a vacuum and make a nice impression on my face. I've done that. You know, <laughs> and, you say, and, and your face just gets longer. You never done this? Yes. This is what I do in my spare time. No, I, as a child. Or you could fill the glass with water. You fill the glass with water, then there's no air in there, is there? And I think the scripture is talking about adding to our lives and being ready to give a defense and always pursuing those things of God and adding to our lives and filling up with the Holy Spirit and God's word. And guess what? We're not going to have any time for stupid things. There's a saying, if you want something done, give it to someone who's busy. Have you heard this? Yeah. It's, it's not the guy with the clean desk that gets things done. It's the guy that's got a stack of a million things. 
You see, he's driven on because he's got stuff to do. And do you think he's going to be taking a day off? Of course not. He can't because he's got so much to do. And sometimes we think of that as a burden, but it's a blessing. It's called purpose. Because God has given you life so that you can accomplish a certain amount of things. And as long as there are things for you to do, you can't die. Boy, you just believe anything I say, won't you? <laughs> That's why I do everything halfway. Then I'll live forever. As long as my garage is hideous, I, God can't take me home until I get to the garage. So. But that's not true. What is true, however, is if you're always being diligent about checking with the Lord on a regular basis and doing what he wants you to do, you're not going to get into trouble like you would if you had a lot of free time. Right? What are you doing today? Oh, I don't know. I'll just hang out. Where are you going to hang out? Oh, I don't know. Pick a place that's safe. But you can get in trouble anywhere. Right? If your life is full of purpose, and if you're purposing yourself for the Lord, guess what? And if you're adding to your life all of these things, you will never stumble. The scripture says that, not Pastor Dave. So if you want to read that, it's 2 Peter 1.10. Galatians 5.16 and 17. He says, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You got a problem with the lust of the flesh? It's probably because you have an opportunity. I don't know anybody who has a porn problem who says, I don't have a computer. I don't have a phone. If there's opportunity, it can happen, right? Unless you are so busy doing things of the Lord that you got no time for that. Amen. Ain't nobody got no time for that. <laughs> And it's about being employed in the things of God. And it says, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh because you're walking in the spirit. And the, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. So if you're walking according to the spirit, you're not going to do what the, the old man wants you to do. You're going to be doing those things that God wants you to do. So fill up your life with God-honoring things. I'm preaching to people at church, right? I'm, I'm talking to you people. <laughs> <laughs> fill up your life with purpose for Jesus. And you're not going to be tempted to do the stupid things that you always seem to fall into because you make opportunity for it. By the way, that word ceased means paused. That might help you. The original meaning in the Greek, if you go and you find, it actually means paused. We says ceased, and it's like they're deceased. Yeah, they're gone. But it means paused. Do you know what it's like to be tempted in a certain thing and just say, nah, not right now? Yes. Yes. You don't have to say no forever. You just say, no, not now. That's a good first step. I, I was here till like, uh, I didn't eat until 3 o'clock yesterday. And I was hungry. And you know what they keep in the fridge? <laughs> There's some carbs in that fridge, I can tell you. So what I say to myself is, nah, not now. And you know what? That's good enough. And the devil goes, I actually went home and had steak. I had leftovers. I love leftovers. You can cease the activity of sin by filling yourself up with the things of God. I just think that's amazing. So if I'm full of water, I'll never be full of air. That's really what it is. So, the one who has suffered... If we're willing to suffer and say yes to God and no to sin, then we can cease from sin. It's about saying yes to God and saying no to our flesh. He no longer should live his time in the flesh through the lusts of men. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I, have I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by faith in the Son of God 
who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, he says, I don't do what I want to do anymore. I've given my life to Christ. I'm his servant. He says, jump, I say how high. That's it. It's the end of my life. And that's what happens when you give your life to Jesus. It's not a decision to ask Jesus into your life as an ingredient in your life. You're asking him to be the Lord of your life, which means he tells you what to do and you do it. And I'll tell you what, what a great journey that is. It's the best, amen? amen. And but for the will of God, it says that we should live for the rest of our time here in the flesh, not by the less of men, but for the will of God. That's what every single person that comes to Jesus Christ has to understand. That's what your life is about. It's not doing what you want. It's doing what God wants you to do. What is his will? If you remember Jesus in the garden as he prayed, he prayed, Father, if this cup can pass from me, and yet not my will be done, but your will be done. He says in Luke twenty-two forty-two, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Boy, that's a really good prayer, isn't it? Lord, I don't want to do what I want to do. I really don't. I want to do what you want me to do. And you have to change what you desire. And in Matthew 6, 9, 10, we're told to pray this way. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, who art. You guys probably know the who art part, at which some people think that's his name. Well, they do. They're, they're children, but yes. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For us to pray that, we're praying to God to make us willing vessels in his kingdom. We're submitting ourselves to his authority and his leadership. It's not just something, our Father in heaven, kingdom, power, and glory, amen. Although you might memorize it that way, you're certainly not praying. You're just speaking. But to understand your will be done on earth, that means I have to be part of it. It means me, I have to be on board. I've got to be you know, on the map where he wants me to be. We live for the will of God. Look, we've gotten to verse 3. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. Do you guys think you've spent enough time wasting time doing stupid things? You think so? Yeah. I would hope so. We have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, I'm sure you would never tell your kids this. But if mommy or daddy has a tattoo... You think you spent enough time doing all those stupid things? And yet they tend to be the things that you think about, right? I think we spend enough time doing those things, don't you? Just give you an idea what lewdness is, because it's probably not a vocabulary word you understand. Unbridled lust, excess, licentiousness, lasciviousness, wantonness, outrageousness, shamelessness, and insolence. Isn't the English language wonderful? It's just letting it all out, if you will. I don't know about you guys, letting it all out never worked well for me. How about you? Lewdness, lusts. By the way, uh, lusts, almost, almost everyone puts it to some sexual desire. It just means strong desire. Uh, Jesus said, I desire to share this cup with you, this supper with you. He was talking about the Last Supper. That's the same word that's used here for lust. So it's not sexual lust, it just means strong desire. Okay? So that you guys don't get triggered by the word lust. It means desire, craving, longing, desire for what is forbidden or lust. So some, um, sometimes it is used for that which you cannot have, which automatically makes you want to have it. Like telling the kid, you can't have a cookie till after dinner. And all he's doing is focusing on the cookie jar. Okay, mom, go away. <laughs> so they could steal a cookie. That's what it is. Lusts. Drunkenness. Drunkenness. The, I, I'm not going to put up the Greek words because I can't even pronounce them sometimes. An overflow or surplus of wine. Vignancy. Drunkenness. 
or an excess of wine. It's, you, it's overboard, okay? You've, you've gone overboard. You didn't just have a teaspoon of NyQuil. Uh, you, you drank the whole bottle. So drunkenness is an overflow or a surplus. Revelries is a carousal, being let loose, reveling or rioting, um, riotous living the King James uses. Those are revelries. Drinking parties. You guys know what a drinking party is? That's when people worship Bacchus, okay? They're, they're worshiping alcohol. Alcohol is the center of why you are all gathering. What kind of alcohol do you have? Is it beer? Is it wine? Is it liquor? Is it, are we doing shots? Are we playing pong? Ping! You know, what are we doing? <laughs> drinking parties. By the way, if you're invited to a drinking party, party, don't go. It's worship of alcohol. I'm not sure you want to be involved in that. That's, a, that's called idolatry. Or abominable idolatries, which is image worship image worship. So, uh, you know, you probably don't have some kind of a golden calf in your house. You probably don't think that idol worship happens, but it's worshiping an image. It's taking something and putting it on a throne where God really belongs. That's what idolatry is. Putting something out of category and putting it higher than it should be. That's called idolatry. Image worship. That's why they call it American Idol. There are people that worship success. They worship and they grope and they grab to be at the top and they'll do whatever they can to get there. When you worship something in the place of God, it, it could, be, could be money. It could be status. It could be I need to have the biggest house. It could be I need to have the fastest car. It could be I need to have the most beautiful wife. Well, I really don't love, but man, she's pretty hot, isn't she? And she makes me look good. It's whatever it is that you put on a plane higher than it should be. That's an idol. And, you know, we can harbor little idols inside our heart. You know, sometimes our hobbies are our, oh, Pastor Dave, don't say that. Yeah, sometimes our hobbies, you know, if, if golfing is your game and you're spending thousands of dollars on golf and, and hundreds of hours on that and your family's falling apart, guess what? You got an idol problem. If, if you're into cars and fixing up cars, you know, that's all well and good. But if your relationships don't run as well as your car, you've got a problem. That's an idle problem. If you've got a giant clothes closet full of clothes and yet you can't find anything to wear, you might have an idle problem. Make sense? Yes. Okay, I'm working on mine. I won't tell you what it is. <laughs> Verse 4, in regard to these... All of these things that you used to do that, the, the, from lewdness on down, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them. Who's them? Them are the people that still all do that stuff. In the same flood of dissipation, <laughs> speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Listen, I remember when I became a Christian... And I started telling people I was a Christian. They were telling me what an idiot I was. They thought I was brilliant before then. But that's when I was doing all the same things they were doing. But suddenly, I'm not doing the same things they're not doing. I'm, I'm not doing drugs anymore, or smoking pot anymore, or getting drunk anymore, or carousing, uh, not doing all that junk. And they suddenly say, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> I had a sergeant told me, you know, you should be out there. I said, Really? said, you got a couple of daughters? Yeah, he changed his tune real quick. <clears throat> he said I should be out there carousing and picking up women and sowing my oats and all this stuff. And I said, you really think so? He says, yeah. And I said, you, and I act like I was convinced. And I said, well, you got a couple of daughters, right? He said, something was wrong with me. Here's a guy telling me to do something that he wouldn't have his daughters doing. They think it's strange that you don't do what they do, and then they think there's something wrong with you. I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than to stand with the world and be judged by God. The, uh, <laughs> the flood of dissipation here, the excess of riot is actually what the King James uses. It, it means just going absolutely wild. If, you've, if you guys ever watch a riot on TV, you know what it is to go wild. 
People just shoot guns, they set things on fire, they destroy stuff, they jump up and down on cars, they break glass, they break into places, they steal things. That's what they're talking about. That's the human heart not fettered by Jesus Christ. That's the human heart. That's what you and I are capable of doing, having been let loose. That's the same evil in them that once was in us. And Jesus came in and changed our nature. Praise God that we're not involved in doing that stupid stuff. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. And there are some people that say that when you die, you go, you go up to Jesus and Jesus gives you the gospel and you get a chance to receive the gospel at that point, or you're going straight to hell. The Bible didn't teach that anywhere. But they'll use scriptures like this to say that. So I just want to want to help you to understand what it means. It says that for this reason, the gospel was preached. That word means evangelizo, okay? It means to evangelize. It means good words. It's, it's uh, logia, which is word, and eu, which is good. So it's good words. That's the good news. That's what the gospel is. The gospel was preached to the dead. Do you know anything about this? Well, if, if I add one word of clarity, it will probably help you. For this reason, the gospel was preached to those who are already dead. There are people that have passed on from this world and already are in the presence of Jesus Christ. They were evangelized so that they might be judged in the flesh and yet vindicated in the spirit. And so it's talking about those who have passed on and gone before us, just so that you understand. Okay? So evangelizo, because there's nobody being evangelized in hell. Okay? There's nobody giving the gospel before they, they get that chance. Because the scripture says it's appointed unto a man once to die and then the judgment. So this is all you get. And if you die prematurely before you accept Jesus Christ, there's no hope. That, that is the bottom line. So, death comes for us all, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all ready. You got your ticket? I sure hope you do. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. The scripture says we're supposed to be serious and watchful in our prayers. Because the end is at hand. Do you realize that this book is like, this book of the Bible is like 2,000 years old? And Peter thought, this is it. This is the end. But the end of all things is at hand. I mean, it's here. It's coming. That was 2,000 years ago. That tells me that the disciples always lived with an ever-present knowledge of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at any moment. And he says, these are the things we're to think on and encourage one another on. Not that God's going to come back and beat his bride before he takes us home. He's going to come and take us home. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. I think about Jesus when he was in the garden and he stopped praying. He came back to his disciples and he asked them to watch and to pray. And he found them asleep. He goes, guys, what are you sleeping? Couldn't you, couldn't you stay up one hour with me? Oh, we're tired. Yeah, I get that. But pray. Pray with me, will you? And he goes a little bit away and he prays the same prayer three times. And uh, it's a good thing that John at least, you know, was there and he heard what was going on because he wrote it down but Jesus came back three times and he goes you guys are still sleeping okay well, I'm glad you got your sleep because my betrayer's here I gotta go and that's it that was the end of Jesus on his way to the cross and they wasted the last hours by sleeping if they would have known if we would have known and so let's be watchful in our prayers it says in Matthew 26 41 Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That is true, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so we need to overcome the flesh with the spirit, which means we need to submit ourselves to God and pray and be watchful. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. Fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Oh, you, you good people never grumble. <laughs> right? 
You're never dissatisfied with anything. Not at work, not in church. That's why it says don't, do it, don't grumble, because we do. It's our tendency. So above all things, have fervent love. The word fervent means stretched out. You know what's stretched out? I, I don't know if you guys know what this toy is. Yes. This is Stretch Armstrong. I want to introduce you to an old toy. Stretch Armstrong was this little muscly dude who you could stretch and stretch and stretch, and, and he would just keep going. When, it, when the Bible says, above all things have fervent love, it means that you have this love that's stretched out. Do you feel a little stretched out, people? Are you feeling a little overwhelmed with the amount of love that you have to give to people? <laughs> and everybody seems to have a need, and you seem to be the only one filling that need. And you're like Stretch Armstrong, and yet we're told to have fervent love, a love that can be stretched, that you're willing to stretch out to love somebody. It's easy to love somebody. Like, I have two circular saws. If you need one, I'll be glad to give it to you. No stretch for me. You need me to come to your house for two hours, that's going to be hard because my schedule's pretty tight. You want me to help you with something that's going to require a lot of time and effort and energy. Wow, that's really stretching me. But God will give you strength. And God will give you what you need to do the things he needs you to do. Amen? In your own strength, you'll be like the Ken doll. Crack. Oh, wow, he, he doesn't stretch much. Stretch Armstrong just keeps on going. And so did Jesus. Because he stretched out his love. You want to talk about fervent love, he opened up his arms and he died on the cross. That was God's love for you. Do you think it was a stretch? Do you think it was hard? Do you think it was difficult? Do you think he suffered? Of course he did. And he did it for you. So why can't we do it for another fellow sinner? Jesus, who was perfect, did it for us. We certainly can stretch out for somebody else. And it says that love covers a multitude of sins. I'm thinking about Noah. If you remember the story of Noah, he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham walks into his tent and Noah is naked in his tent. So he should have knocked, right? He walks into his tent, and Noah is drunk, on the floor, naked. I know I'm triggering some of you people. And Ham went and told his two brothers, and said, Dad's all drunk in the tent. Come on, let's go look at him. What Shem and Japheth did was they took a... They took a a, a blanket, and they walked backwards into the tent, and they covered their father so they wouldn't look on his nakedness. Now, which of them did what was right? Love covers a multitude of sins. When you love somebody, you can cover things with love. Tons and tons and tons of things. You can forgive and forgive and forgive. If Jesus forgave you of this long list, can't you forgive short lists that other people have? Of course. Be like Shem and Japheth. Cover people. Because it's better than exposing their nakedness. And it says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. By the way, that doesn't mean, uh, like the session after this where we have coffee and cake, we call that fellowship. That's, that's just food. Fellowship is what happens between people. It's when people are sharing their lives together. That's what fellowship is. And it says that you should practice hospitality. Be hospitable to one another without Grumbling. There's the word, by the way, for hospitality. Philoxenos. Everybody say philoxenos. Philoxenos. You guys are speaking Greek. Look at that. Philoxenos. The first is philo, which means brotherly love. And xenos is the end, which means stranger. It means being a lover of strangers. Hospitality is being a lover of strangers. Isn't that weird? You should love strangers. How do you address somebody who you really love and who you know? You say, hey, how you doing? You give them a hug, right? Imagine you did that to a stranger. 
Hey, I don't know you. Come here. Give me a hug. <laughs> of course, you want to love them in a way in which they perceive it as love and not aggression or weirdness. <laughs> but to be a lover of strangers, in other words, hey, I don't know you. I'm not comfortable with that. Who are you? Where are you from? What's going on in your life? How can I help you? That's loving a stranger. Like, do you know who's a visitor here for the very first time? If you're a lover of strangers, you'll know. Because you look for those people that you don't know, instead of the clique of the people that you usually hang out with and talk about, you know, things. You become a lover of strangers. So to practice hospitality is to be a lover of strangers, and you do it without grumbling. Because, you know, if you get to know people, and especially strangers, they need stuff. Hey, can I borrow your car tomorrow? I don't know you, man. What's up with that? You're asking me a question like that. Would you be willing to do that? I'm just saying. And I'm going to leave it right there because we're completely out of time. And that's usually the way it is. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. If they can, we're going to play one more song for you so we can worship God. I hope you guys are enjoying going through Peter. There's a lot of meat on the bone. So uh, as soon as we're done with this song, we're going to start to get ready for the baptism. It's going to happen right out here on the lawn in our semi-heated jacuzzi.